welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we tackle the negative culture around sleep? And I'm in conversation with Vicky Dawson. My name is Vicky Dawson and I'm the CEO and the founder of The Sleep Charity. Um, we were originally called the Children's Sleep Charity and we offered, and we still do offer, support for families who have children or young people with sleep issues. And over the last year, the charity's evolved and uh, we've had a name change and we've also widened our remit as well because what we're finding is there's an awful lot of people out there with sleep issues and they don't know where to go for evidence-based information. And the kind of episode question that we're going to dive in with is how can we tackle the negative culture around sleep? And I wondered if you could just talk to that point for a moment and and just set us going, really. Yeah, I mean, sleep doesn't get the attention it deserves. So I think there's an awful lot of work that we need to do around educating people about sleep for a start. And that education ideally needs to start in the early years. So um, giving positive messages to youngsters about the importance of sleep. And I think that there's a role there for parents. And quite often, you know, you will hear parents sort of say, if you don't behave well, I'm sending you to bed. So sleep becomes this sanction and the bedroom becomes a place where children want to avoid they don't want to be Um, and you also hear sleep being used as or sleep deprivation even being used as a reward so if you're good you can stay up late which when you actually look at that logically is utterly ridiculous because sleep deprivation you know it's a form of torture so why would you sleep deprive children Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done around that and educating parents about sleep is so important you know In the work that we do, often families feel that they're really failing if the child's not sleeping. And actually, they've probably never had any sleep education. So we're really good at doing stuff around like behaviour. You know, there's um, lots of information out there about weaning, potty training. But when it comes to sleep, um, there's such varied information. And a lot of the professionals who you would expect to be passing on this information don't ever have any sleep in the training, which I was absolutely astounded about when, um, you know, I set the charity up, I just presumed that um, they would all be well trained in it. So I think the major thing is education, because if we can empower people with knowledge about sleep, then they can start to understand why some of the sleep issues have occurred, and they will understand more about which strategies might help. And also, hopefully, we can prevent a lot of things occurring by having that knowledge, you know, securely in place right from the start. And why is sleep so important? Because it feels like underlying a lot of what you're saying, there's a basic cultural misunderstanding about the potential importance of sleep. So maybe you can educate us on that a little bit about why it matters so much. Yeah, it's hugely important for sort of every aspect of our well-being. So if we look at things like mental health, as an example, um, you know, there's a huge link between mental health issues and sleep deprivation. So we know that if we become sleep deprived, we can increase our anxiety. Um, We also know that there's lots of links and evidence research around things like depression and sleep deprivation. So the two are really closely entwined. Um, Also things like um, behavior. Uh, So what happens, and you can can kind of think about this from your own perspective, if you're sleep deprived, you don't behave as well as you would. You know, you can become irrational, you can become snappy, all those things. And what we see in children is quite often they become hyperactive. Um, They find it difficult to concentrate in school. Um, Sleep deprivation impacts on memory. Um, And we're we're actually sort of, our brains are still working when we're sleeping. So we're consolidating our learning during the night. So it's really, really important that children do get adequate sleep, but also good quality sleep. Then there's the physical side of things. So, you know, while while we're asleep, there's hormones being released. 
and there's research around obesity and sleep so we need to get enough sleep in order to regulate our appetites and also sleep helps our tissues to repair so you know the blood's released during um, sleep and it helps with the whole repair of our systems there's the immunity factor as well there's research that suggests that our immune system's lower if we are sleep deprived so we start to sort of pick up all sorts of bugs and uh, colds and all the things that we might have fought off usually and when you start to look at the impact of sleep deprivation it gets quite depressing because it really is linked to so many things um and i try to turn that around and look at actually sleep is you know a superpower it's something that we all need it's free of charge and actually if we get it we're going to be feeling mentally more alert we're going to look better because our appearance is affected um, we're going to be healthier um, and we're going to be more resilient and I think the key phrase for me is we're going to be able to meet our full potential if we sleep well. And how do you balance the getting across the importance of a good night's sleep without panicking people who might have rubbish sleep? So Adrian Bethune, who uh, is one of my Twitter followers and, and uh, has written a great book on, on well-being for teachers. And, and we often do talk about the importance of sleep in, in our kind of work. But I think that's a really important question. So we're telling people how important it is. But if they find it hard to sleep and they've got challenges there, how do we not panic them? Yeah, it is really difficult. And I think it is just about the messages that we are trying to put across and putting them across differently. So rather than focusing on this is what happens if you don't get good sleep, actually turning it around and this is what can happen if you do get good sleep. And one of the things that we've done recently is partner up with Sean the Sheep because, uh, you know, he's got a massive reach and um, we've been working with Sean to push out positive sleep messages um, about, you know, to, to try and turn that tide um, and to reduce some of those anxieties because it's really unhelpful to tell somebody who is struggling with sleep that actually, you know, all these things will happen to you if you can't go to sleep because the thing about sleep is you can't force it. So you cannot force yourself to go to sleep. It's impossible. So messages like that can just increase the anxiety which will have exactly the opposite effect to the effect that we're wanting to have. You know, most people who have sleep issues recognise the impact it's having. Um, they know the impact. So what we're looking at there is to try to give them some helpful strategies to deal with that. And we're also campaigning as well to raise awareness about the importance of sleep and the lack of support that's out there. So we just managed to sneak in our manifesto on the 4th of March um, in Westminster before the lockdown. And that was all around um, sort of raising awareness about how important sleep is. And we had some great speakers. So we had Mark Rowland, who's um, CEO of Mental Health Foundation, speaking about the importance of sleep for mental health. Um, and, you know, within that manifesto, it is around actually professionals need to be able to access training around sleep and people who are having issues need to be able to access support and appropriate information because sleep isn't regulated so anybody can claim to be a sleep expert and you know there's lots of sort of private companies some with you know really appropriate backgrounds and training but others perhaps not and people don't know where to turn for the information so you know this is a big part of the work moving forward to try to address that and in terms of those sort of you know you talked about sharing practical strategies with people maybe can you give us a bit of a glimpse into the kinds of things that may be helpful because I'm sure that some people would have tuned into the podcast actually because they are concerned about their own sleep or the sleep of a colleague or a child that they care for and um, so what kind of things do you advise to people yeah, so before we start advising, we would be doing a full assessment so that we can start to unpick where the sort of sleep issues may be coming from. Because sometimes it is more than um, a behavioural approach can address. So it's really important that we pick up on things like potential um, sleep disorders that need referring in. So by that, I mean things like obstructive sleep apnea, which is sleep disordered breathing. Um, also, 
you know, we do pick up a lot of people who need referring in for um, mental health support. Um, but if we're looking at the behavioural side of sleep, once we've done the assessment, we'll actually educate um, families and we will um, explain to them about the sleep cycles, the circadian rhythm, um, the role of melatonin and light and dark. And then we'll start to explore strategies. And generally speaking, I mean, every single sleep program we do is completely different because sleep is such a, a personal thing. We all have different sleep needs, different sleep associations, things that help us to sleep well. Um, but we will be looking at that hour before bedtime and we'll be looking at the timing of bedtime. So quite often, um, you know, we, we have youngsters who are going to bed and it's taking them hours to fall asleep because the circadian rhythm is sort of out of, of line. And in those cases, we may be suggesting a late bedtime until we can actually move bedtime um, forward. But what we'll be looking at in terms of the hour before bedtime is things like appropriate foods um, to have during the evening. So moving away from sort of sugared type snacks and caffeine, obviously, um, and having things like maybe cereal and, um, you know, yogurts, those sorts of things. And we'll be exploring activities as well. So really unpopular advice, but getting rid of the screens. Um, you know, we see a huge improvement in sleep once the screens have disappeared um, and that you know there is some research that suggests the light from screens can actually suppress the melatonin and uh, making it harder to fall asleep at night time so it's like what do you do then if you've not got the screens there that's a big question and we'll have conversations about what are you interested in you know what is it that you want to do at night time um, what helps you to relax where are your areas of interest because what we've got to create is a routine that is really helpful um, and that people are willing to engage in, not a routine that people dread, you know, want to make bedtime positive again. And then we'll look at things like temperature. So quite often bedrooms are too warm. So maybe 16 to 18 degrees, which feels quite cool, but we do need this cooler environment to be able to sleep well at night time. And we'll look at the bedroom environment in all kinds of ways. So, you know, blackout blinds, maybe they could help. Um, or, ironically, blackout blinds and a nightlight. So the real thing about sleep is we have to have consistency all the way through the night. So however we go to sleep at the start of the night, those conditions need to be maintained all the way through the night because we cycle in and out of sleep and we come to these points of partial wakening and if everything is the same as when we went to sleep we'll probably just sort of turn over and carry on and we might not even remember it but if things are different that's when we wake up and we see quite a lot of differences made by parents and um, with all of the right intentions um, in children's sleep environments so we'll be looking for those kind of things too so you know a child goes to sleep with the landing light on a parent turns it off when they go to bed. And then when a child comes to a point of partial awakening, they wake up fully because they're suddenly in this darkened environment. And evolutionarily, I, I guess that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You're presumably on some quite deep level, just checking that everything's safe. Um, and if things have changed, then there's a question, isn't it? It introduces that amb ambiguity. Okay, that's really interesting. So keeping things really, really consistent. And in terms of, you're talking there about strategies that we can use um, if perhaps people are struggling, but presumably you use those similar ideas for actually establishing positive sleep patterns right from the very, very early days with, with little children as well. Yeah, we do. Um, we don't work with youngsters under the age of 12 months. Um, babies are supposed to wake up. Uh, so it's a, a lot about normalising infant sleep patterns as well, because quite often, you know, parents get really concerned that the, the young babies are waking and it's like that is actually really good that they're rousable. You know, that is what we're wanting. They need to feed during the night. And there's so much going on in those first 12 months in terms of development. So we start at 12 months, but we do offer, you know, the information about routines because routines are so, so important. And, you know, our bodies thrive on routine, our circadian rhythms thrive on routine. So um, having those regular wait times, having those regular bedtimes um, is really useful. And having the cues around sleep as well, 
So even as adults, you know, our teenagers too, not using the bed to do work. So not checking emails in bed because we want to build this really strong association between bed is for sleeping. Um, so there's sort of little tips that you can do, but right from the very start, things like changing into nightwear at night time, you know, that indicates that actually it's the end of the day. Dimming the lights, that's hugely important to help to produce the melatonin. So our bodies, um, you know, really rely on light and darkness in order to regulate the circadian rhythm. And the darkness helps us to produce that melatonin. Um, which helps us to feel sleepy and to nod off. And the daylight helps us to suppress it, which is really difficult when it's sort of miserable winter days, but just getting half an hour outside or sitting by the window. Or some people use light boxes as well, um, just for half an hour to help themselves to wake up. So the use of light is, you know, really, really important and the timings too. So doing everything sort of at the same time, seven days a week. Seven days a week, so we can't have a lion at the weekend. Well, <laughs> uh, it will be a lovely thought. And what we say is when we're doing the actual programs with families, just go for like doing this rigidly until you get the routine really firmly in place. And you could try to do things, you know, and move things on by maybe an hour. Um, but what you might actually find is that you let youngsters have a late night and they still get up at the same time the next morning. And then what happens is actually they're an hour sleep deprived. You have a pretty miserable weekend because they're cranky and it's not actually worth it. Now, some children will sleep in later and it won't, you know, won't affect them at all and they'll be fine. Some are just great sleepers. Uh, but for others, um, you know, you have to question, is it actually worth that extra hours lying or not? Um, and what you tend to find is you keep them up later at night time. So you've not got your evenings and then they're still up at the same time in the morning. So you've not actually gained a great deal. So my advice would be try to keep it fairly structured. The bedtime, certainly. But the, yeah, the get up. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I often find myself advising people if they're looking at their own kind of sleep uh, pattern as an adult is I often just say, do what you would do for a toddler, because I think we're quite good, aren't we? Thinking about what bedtime routines might look like for younger children. And we do do those things. We do think having a nice bath and make sure they've eaten their tea and that you're in your pajamas and you might read a story and you do it at the same time every night. But then as adults, often that all goes out the window when we're working until the 11th hour and yeah not not creating that nice environment for ourselves and I yeah I think often if we treat ourselves more like a four-year-old <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean we just kind of don't prioritize it at all for ourselves and we're so busy doing other things and I, I read something the other day and it really made me laugh because it, it said something about you know we're the only species that actually deprives ourselves of sleep you know can you imagine a cat deciding I'm you know mm -hmm can't sleep now I've got to go out and do stuff well no because it's ridiculous but this is what we do you know we feel tired and actually we put it off because we're so busy and we've got to do all these other things but our body is telling us that we need this rest um, and you're absolutely right you know we need these bedtime routines in place as well and again you know some adults are great sleepers but you know stats out there are about 40 percent of the population aren't which is a huge you know, number um, who are struggling with sleep. And it is about having that routine. And I think another important thing is not to overdo it. So when you ask somebody who has got either a child with a sleep issue or they've got a sleep issue, and you say, what do you do to try to get to sleep? And they will say, oh, I've tried everything. And then there'll be this huge list of, I do lavender in the bath, I do pillow sprays, I do chamomile tea. And it's almost become sort of, it's built up this anxiety to the point where you get in bed and you've done that much that it's just feeding it rather than being helpful. So it's going back to basics and making sure that you have got that wind down time, that you are avoiding the screens, you're doing something relaxing, you're comfortable in your bed, you know. It's like thinking about your mattress, your pillows. Are they actually comfortable? Are you getting too hot in there? Um, is your temperature regulated? All those things. And we just don't think about it um, in those terms, I'm afraid. But I love that, to treat yourself like a four-year-old. That's a great <laughs> one. 
Steph Little, who's an educational psychologist, uh, tweeted when I said I was going to be chatting to you saying, when did sleep become unfashionable? Uh, me personally, I love it, but going to bed early seems to be a problem for some just out of principle. Oh, wow. What an interesting question. I actually don't know. Um, certainly, you know, when I, I look back through my life, there's points where it has been unfashionable or it's almost been like a badge of honour to not need much sleep so you know I remember reading about Margaret Thatcher didn't need many hours sleep uh, I think President Trump has made similar claims and <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um, it just like I, I don't know but it certainly is there and it certainly is hugely concerning and uh, particularly as we've moved throughout more through into this 24 7 culture mm. um and i think you know we've seen certainly sleep issues increasing because going back to when i was young uh, the children's tv programs went off they just turned off at you know six o'clock there was nothing for kids to watch on tv and actually the tv channels turned off themselves at midnight so there wasn't this entertainment going on 24 7 mm. um Another interesting question that I ponder, and I've got no answer to whatsoever, is at what point do children start to see sleep as a positive? So if you talk to little ones about sleep, they will resist it. Uh, you know, uh, we did some work actually last year with a theatre company because we are hoping to take, well, we should have been taking a piece of theatre on tour around schools with a company called Tutti Fruity. And we're working with the research team at Sheffield Children's Hospital on this. And um, there was some work done uh, with focus groups in schools asking children, what do they think about sleep? And, you know, the words coming back was like, it's boring. And there was no positives <clears throat> around sleep yet. You ask older people what to think about sleep and we see it as being wonderful and we really enjoy it and i'm interested in when that change happens and what we can do to try to make the younger generation be positive about sleep and this is you know why we buy into the the sean stuff and working alongside them to try to put those positive messages and this is why the piece of theater that we've been developing um was done to try to again educate but also give some positives about how important sleep is and how it can help us to perform better. I think that's such an important question and one as a parent I find myself sort of battling so my children are um, 11 and they will see being asked to go to bed on time as almost like some kind of punishment and you know I have really good and open discussions with them about sleep and the importance of sleep and I think they get it more than probably many kids do but still they yeah they see it as a reward to stay up late or that going to bed is boring and I'm like but going to bed's wonderful I love it you know <laughs> but again that it's a journey as you say I I was definitely someone who for large parts of my life was quite sleep deprived and people used to say to me things like oh how are you so productive and I'd say well I work 100 hours of sleep 100 hours a week and I hardly ever sleep um and people would say oh well done but that isn't right is it <laughs> Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, you know, that message gets reinforced, doesn't it? And then you kind of feel like you've got to be getting up earlier and staying later. And the kind of more you do, the more comes in to do. So it, it feeds into itself. Um, and it is hard to have those boundaries, but I think it is just so, so very important. Yeah. And the other thing that we've sort of got as well is the circadian rhythms going on and you know children have got those so some of us are night owls and some of us are larks and some have got no you know no real sort of strong preference but sometimes we're working against those because of society so you know I, I feel for teenagers because their circadian rhythms go through this biological change which means that actually they don't release the melatonin until much later so you'll find they're not falling asleep until two, three in the morning, but school times have got earlier and earlier. And, you know, they really struggle to get up in the morning and um, they kind of wake up just around about the time that they're coming home um, mm -hmm. to end the day. Um, and this is where we've just got sort of real differences in the way that our body clocks work and the way that sort of society works. And there are ways that we can make those tweaks and get 
um, young people back on track. But if they've not got the support to do that, then it's really tough because changing sleep is oh, it's such hard work. It's a behaviour um, that we need to change. And, you know, we're resistant to making change, mm-hmm. um, especially when we're tired. So what we find is that the support along the way is absolutely key to keep people going, you know, to champion them along, to coach them along, to make these changes. And have you had any success in terms of what is effective when educating young people and trying to bring them on board with this message? I mean, does it help them to understand, you know, the impact of their sleep on their attainment or enjoyment of life? Or does it sit well with some of the self-care messages maybe, which are a little bit more kind of popular with, with younger people than they might have been in, in previous generations? Or yeah, what's what, I mean, you, you talked about the, the theatre production you were looking to do. So I'm guessing this is an area that you're interested in in, in developing. Yeah, it's an area hugely interested in. Um, we did some work a few years ago now as a bit of a pilot study with um, young people in secondary schools. And uh, it was really great. We got some funding from Paul Hamlin Foundation and we could basically go into five different secondary schools and ask young people, what did they want? You know, what what would be helpful for them? And they wanted some help, basically. Um, so... The um, pizza budget was actually used to support the filming of a piece of theatre in one of the schools that the young people wanted to make um, because they were saying what they needed was information. That was the key bit. Um, And they didn't know where to find it. And they would go on Google and there'd be lots of different sort of things on there, lots of products claiming that it's going to help you to sort your sleep out. And they just didn't know where to start and um, from there we developed a a parent workshop um, and a a pupil workshop and our sleep champion um, sort of project started which we've developed a little bit further over the lockdown and the idea is we'll get a sleep champion in every school across the country so that young people have got somebody who has been trained in sleep so that they can go take the sleep issues there and have a discussion and they will have empathy it will be non-judgmental um because it's not as simple as just saying go to bed earlier um and the other thing that we've done during the lockdown is we managed to get some funding to develop a teen sleep hub which went live in october and i think in the first uh, few weeks it had like four thousand hits and we developed that with young people so we had Um, young people's advisory boards that we set up and they helped us um, to develop the content and they helped us with the language to use the look of it and they were saying that what they want is again the information the education um, so that they can go through the ebook and they can sort of find tips for themselves as well to try um, to develop their understanding but the biggest message we got was that they want people to understand They don't want to be viewed as lazy, they're struggling and they want parents to understand and they want uh, staff in schools to understand that it's really difficult to change the sleep patterns. And I think there is often a a lot of misunderstanding about quite how much sleep teenagers in particular need, isn't there? Because we know that little children need a lot of sleep and that becomes perhaps, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but my understanding is always it becomes a bit less. But then as we kind of hit adolescence, our need for sleep increases because we've got, you know, so much brain development and stuff going on and that maybe we don't realise that 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 changing need over time. Yeah, that's it. And I think as well, because of this delayed sleep phase, you know, people think that they just don't need the amount of sleep because they can't get to sleep, but actually they do. It's just the timings of the sleep. Mm -hmm. And the big problem that we see is that the teenagers are getting up for school, going to school, coming back and quite often having a nap because they're just so exhausted. And then, of course, that makes it all worse because during the daytime we build up our sleep drive so we get up in the morning and sort of I always think about it as a battery our batteries are are full Mm. and then as we go through the day they get depleted until bedtime when your battery needs recharging again but what happens with these naps is they're getting that recharge to a certain point and then when bedtime comes they can't get to sleep because they've got the melatonin thing going on, but also they've had this sleep. So it's mm. sort of making the problem much worse. And then the weekend comes and what happens is they typically stay in bed until lunchtime. 
So again, the sleep drive is massively reduced for those weekends. So they're going to bed even later mm -hmm. and it just continues. And what we have to do with young people is work with them to gradually move the sleep routines to a more appropriate time. Um, and, you know, largely they really they engage really well. They want to do the work. Um, they are committed to it. Um, and grateful that they're getting some support so we've had real positives from working with young people and is napping always a bad thing see i'm a big fan of the power nap when you feel that exactly as you say your battery depleting sometimes i know if i'm going to teach and it's i'm not teaching till four o'clock in the afternoon and i'm feeling a bit you know drained 20 minutes sleep and i'm on it but maybe not i don't know what's your what's your no power nap absolutely i'm a big fan myself um, <laughs> it, it's about sort of the timing of it it's about making sure that it's not too long um and you know it can be really helpful uh, for exactly that reason it can just sort of get you back to that right place and particularly if you're doing things like driving you know it's so important that we're not driving around sleep deprived and mm -hmm. um, so power naps can be really important really valuable and i think sometimes naps get bad press so you know parents when you look at the early years they will knock off naps because they presume that that's the cause of sleep issues at night time but what we know is that naps can actually help you to sleep better as well because if you become sort of chronically sleep deprived that's when you sort of go into this hyperactive mode mm. um so naps i'm a big fan of naps yeah yeah and again as parents that phrase overtired we all kind of recognize that one don't we where the kids become a little bit kind of climbing the walls and it sort of doesn't make sense that there's you're seeing hyperactivity but actually it's yeah as you say very very tired one of the the people who contacted me on twitter um, at History Tastic, uh, who in this context is a mum, she said, um, how will my nearly five year old ever sleep through the night and in her own bed? Um, I'm guessing that's the kind of question you get all the time. Yeah, it is. It is. And, um, you know, it takes work. Some children just do it which is not what that mum will want to hear right now. And others need to learn how to sleep. And it, I always feel that it sounds a little bit odd saying this, but some children, you need to teach them how to sleep. And people worry then that we're talking about controlled crying, leaving children distressed. I'm not talking about that at all. I liken it to potty training. You know, we, we put in effort into teaching our children to use the potty. We put in a lot of patience, etc. cetera. Um, and for some children, they need that with sleep. So uh, that sounds like the um, child is in the parent's bed. And, you know, if that is what the parents are happy with, um, that's absolutely fine. But it also sounds like they might now want her to go into her own room, which is fine too. Um, and it depends again on each family. Sometimes it's real baby steps. Um, it may be just getting that little girl used to being in her bedroom during the daytime mm -hmm. and building some positive associations with the bedroom. It may be having the bedtime story in there initially it may be that um one of the parents actually sleeps in there initially and then we start to gradually retreat out of the bedroom um the thing about children having a parent with them when they sleep is again it comes back to the sleep associations that i talked about so it, the easiest way to think about this is in terms of us sharing our beds with a bed partner yeah so when we get into bed, um, we start to slowly sort of nod off into this stage one of sleep, which is really light sleep. And if a bed partner was to get up, you would sort of wake up and go, where are you going? And that's the same as the parents who sort of lie there and think, brilliant, they've gone to sleep. And they make one attempt to start to do the old commando crawl out of the room. We've all <laughs> been there. Um, and the voice goes, where are you going? And the parents are like, how did they know it? they're in this really light sleep so you've got to wait until they just drop a little bit further till you can escape and then what happens is they go through the sleep cycle so they'll go into the deep sleep and then they'll cycle back up to this partial awakening and again you know think about a time when you've sort of been coming to this point and you've realized that your bed partner's no longer there and you kind of wake up and you think where are they have they gone to the bathroom this is the child who parent has suddenly disappeared so then they will fully awaken because they need the parent there to get back to sleep because they've become an association 
And the difficulty that we have as parents is because we're exhausted and it's the middle of the night, we quite often just go, right, put them back in bed and go back to our room. And the child can't do that because they've not learned to fall asleep at the start of the night without the parent there. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's difficult. Um, You know, parents have got to have the capacity to do this stuff um, and to follow it through for at least two weeks. So sometimes it's about your timing and when you choose to make the changes as well. Because if you start it and then stop it, it's almost worse than never starting it because you're reinforcing the message that if you keep getting up, if you keep doing this, then yeah, you can get back in bed. Um, so I always say to families, you know, when is the best time for you? And what do you actually want to do? What's your goal? Because their goal may not be to have that child back in their, their own room. It might be a much smaller goal to begin with that feels manageable. And I think that the, the one of the points you made there about, you know, as long as the, ha- the family are happy with it, the child being in the family bed isn't necessarily a problem. And I think that's a really important point, actually, because certainly I remember when my children were younger, feeling there was this societal expectation around co-sleeping that they should be in their own beds. But when you think about it from the point of view of the child, I don't like going to sleep on my own. If my husband's not there, I find it really hard to sleep. So it's not surprising that a two, three, four, five year old child might feel a bit uncertain without an adult there I mean in in our family in the end we um I mean th- there comes a point when everyone's just too big for one bed right and uh we we had the discussion with the children and they were motivated to learn to sleep in their own beds but it worked for us by having the conversation with them that if they were scared if they were worried they could come to us and still you know they're in year six and every now and then I'll find one of them just crawls in with us but we all get back to sleep and sleep is the most important thing so we just crack on with it but yeah I don't know other families I know would feel really differently about that but yeah um yeah there's a lot around parenting style and we've got to be respectful about parenting style and um cultural beliefs as well um so you know we really do try to um acknowledge all of those things but what I do find is that people are really judgmental about sleep um so quite often there's a presumption that we are going to be very anti-co-sleeping as a charity which is ridiculous that's not what we're about that we're going to be very into sleep training and um, and these distressed children absolutely not what we're about at all um and if you look at parenting forums you know if you see a a family asking for sleep help wow the the threads often get completely out of control just with judgment about what other people are doing and that really concerns me because actually we all do the best that we can do for our families um and you know we've just got to work in true partnership with families and parents to the experts on their children so that's where we come from listening to the parents and what can work in your home you know what do you want to work in your home Mm. and absolutely no judgment around it because if it's done safely that's absolutely fine and um, if everyone's happy with that and what you described yeah how lovely to have a a little person appear as well you know it's really (laughs) nice to have those cuddles definitely and and actually for us as a family there was a moment in the in time which was really important which was so one of our daughters is um is adopted and she used not to be able to be held or comforted or any of those things and she used to have night terrors and it was very very difficult to support her with that but the point at which actually she trusted us enough and it took a long time but the point at which she trusted us enough that if she was scared in the night she could come and seek comfort from us was a huge milestone so just at an age when most parents would probably have been saying right you've got to be in your own bed now we were like hooray come (laughs) but yeah as you say each each family I think has their their own journey and and I think it's important for people not to feel pressurized by societal expectations as long as things are safe isn't it yeah and I think the point about feeling fearful at night time you know it can be a scary time uh, I saw a reward chart on the market that actually the children got a star for not calling out in the night and it really sort of concerned me that because I would hate to think that one of my children was sitting there during the night terrified mm. but fixated on getting that star because actually you know they need to be able to call out they need to be able to seek the family this is not what it's about at all um 
we need certain things in place to be able to sleep well. And one of those things is to feel that we're safe and that we are secure. And some of the work that we do with the families is sometimes um, putting up pictures, uh, photographs, you know, in the bedroom. So uh, just a reminder that, you know, families are still around. And it's interesting that often we don't have photographs in the bedroom, but we have them in other places in the home. Um, and that can help, you know, some of our children just feel a little bit more secure. Um, but it's so, so important. And, you know, we do things as well, like sometimes um, a T-shirt over the pillow. So we've got that scent of a parent around as well, just to make the child uh aware that when they come up through the partial awakenings, they may just sort of smell the scent and it might be enough just to get another sleep cycle uh, out of it. But yeah, having that that sort of time that they can get up and go to seek that support is really important. And again, lighting, this is where I come back to the light. Lots of our children get anxious in the dark and everything you read virtually says blackout blinds, dark environment, which is the route that I completely went down, you know, with my first child and actually some children do need some light in that room to be able to orientate themselves um particularly if they've got a hearing impairment or a visual impairment that's really important but also if they've got this anxiety about night time they need to just be able to see what is around because it the bedroom looks very different at night time too yeah everything's scarier in the dark isn't it whatever age you are i think you can imagine things and it's challenging so what motivated you to set the charity up in the first place then? Was that to do with your own sort of journey with sleep with your family or what, what was the, the motivation behind it? Um, I suffered from chronic sleep issues uh, with my child and um, I was just desperate for some support, for some information. And I'd kind of never, never really valued sleep and <laughs> I knew that, I was going to be sleep deprived when I became a mum, you know, that's a given. So I was expecting that. And I was also uh, working full time um, from, uh, you know, fairly uh, from the early days, really, with him. So I knew it was going to be really, really tough. So my background is actually in teaching and um, I taught in special schools and um, you know, I worked with children with quite challenging behaviours. Um, and when the sleep didn't start to improve, uh, I found it really difficult to know where to access information. And when I was going to, like, you know, the, the parenting type of groups, it just felt like everyone else had got these perfect children. And I was like, really embarrassed to sort of speak about the difficulties I was having because when I did say something, it almost felt like I was sort of judged or tutted at or... Um, given some advice that was just so simplistic that I'd already tried it and I, I kind of ran out of options and um, I did start to seek some advice from the health visitor when he was about two and a half and she just gave me a book on controlled crying which I remember walking home with it thinking I don't sleep I work full time and she wants me to read a book I <laughs> Uh, and I read about it and it didn't sit comfortably with me at all but I tried it because I was like well a healthcare professional's told me to do this so it must be the right thing to do and I'm desperate and it was just horrific I tried it for one night and one night only and uh, the name control crying there was nothing controlled about it it was just mm -hmm. hideous uh and after that, I went to see the GP and the GP <laughs> told me that children don't sleep and I needed to just get on with it. And the answer was to uh, describe antidepressants. He said I was depressed and I probably was actually. But I think the whole reason was that I was just utterly exhausted and not coping. Mm. Um, so to cut a very long story short, this went on for years until uh, my child was six. And it was through like research that I did myself um learning about sleep um suddenly realizing that there were some sleep consultants in in the uk who'd done some training around behavioral intervention um learning more around that and putting it in place and he slept through after two weeks and it was just well i don't go in i was terrified i thought something dreadful had happened to him because after six years of being up and down all night when you suddenly don't hear your child yeah. you think oh what on earth? And there he was, fast asleep. And so it continued night after night. And it just 
transform my life. It made me feel so much better. I looked better. I was able to pursue a career again because I'd given up my job. Um, I was um, able to get remarried. All sorts of positives came from it. And I started to get emails from people who said, you know, I know you know a bit about sleep. Can you help us? And so in the daytime, I was sort of working full time teaching. And by night, I was uh, sending all these emails out to people from all over the place. Uh, And I thought, I've got to do something more around this because I was just getting inundated. And it really troubled me that people might have my experience and feel really low and not know where to turn so in 2012 I decided to set up the charity not knowing a thing about setting up charities (laughs) and being incredibly naive and thinking you set a charity up and people give you money and then you can help people Um, and it's not been like that at all Uh, it's been really tough Um, but we are managing to support indirectly at the moment about 40,000 families a year by training professionals and then they share the work across the country. So for a small charity, the reach that we've got is, uh, you know, pretty good. Yeah. And what's next for you? So obviously you talked a a few bits as we've been discussing about the the theatre production and um, the the Sleep Champions, but do you have a kind of a a mission? You feel like a woman with a mission. Yeah, what, what, you know, if we, we chatted again in five years time, what do you hope would be different? Um, So what I'd hope is that we've got sleep champions in every school, uh, primary and secondary, so that our children's um, sleep education and the sleep issues are able to be addressed, you know, um, in their locality. Uh, I'd also want specialist um, sleep services in every area across the country, and that's for adults as well. So there's a lot of adults who could really benefit from um, support um, other than prescription drugs. And I would want um, our intervention with children certainly to be the first line of um, action prior to prescribing, because a lot of children are prescribed melatonin. um, And we're doing some research at the moment around that to show that the behavioural intervention can successfully prevent that, but also wean those children off it that don't actually need it. So that's a big sort of vision for me as well. And I want sleep to be right up there on the public health agenda. I want it to sort of sit alongside things like nutrition and exercise, Mm -hmm. um, because we know if we can get good sleep in place, then it has this effect on all other aspects of life, you know, diet, you're more likely to exercise, um, concentration. It has just such a wide reach and not just for individuals, but for society. So things like accidents on the road, you know, from sleep deprived drivers, Mm -hmm. those kind of things. So that's like the big vision. Um, That's where we are heading. Um, And I always describe it as an exciting challenge because sleep isn't very fundable because uh, funders often think that like this is provided by the health service um, and it's actually not in most cases. So it is a challenge being able to find the resources to develop it, but it's something that um, we're getting more and more successful at um, as we're raising the profile of the, the charity. Wow. And, and I've no doubt that, yeah, you've made it such, it's hard to believe you've only been going since 2012, which is relatively young for charity, but, you know, you, yeah, having a, a look at the, the resources you provide and the impact you've had, I've no doubt you will achieve those aims. And how old is your son now? 20. And does he still sleep? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Be success. What, um, what thought would you like to, to close with? People often have like a thought or an action that they would like to leave people with who've, who've listened in? What would be your parting thought? I think to prioritise your sleep. So that is so important. And we prioritise lots of things in our life, but very rarely sleep. But make sleep your priority this year because things are tough at the moment. And, you know, our sleep's been affected uh, during the pandemic. We've seen that at the charity. So it makes sleep a real priority because it underpins absolutely everything. Mm-hmm.